Next, I'd like to introduce Ivan Novik, who is with Pivotal. Ivan's been working on big data, databases, and enterprise systems over a decade. He has spent the last six years in various capacities working on the Green Plum database product, and his passion is building database systems for big data. Ivan? There's the clicker. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, as he mentioned, I'm Ivan, and I'm from Pivotal. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for, um, for inviting the Pivotal people into the Postgres group. You know, we went off on a, a closed source product for a whole number of years, and now recently have open sourced all of our technology. So we're coming to all the Postgres events, and we're really looking forward to being part of the community and working with everybody. With that, um, I'm not actually going to do a presentation about our products and about um, you know, what we build inside Pivotal. But what I wanted to do is kind of share with you kind of my personal thinking about databases and the history of databases so that you can see from our perspective how we see the world. And then from there, understand where we're driving to and how we're trying to push the evolution of database technology with Postgres at the core of, of it. Okay, so it, I only have about 15 minutes, but I'm gonna try in the 15 minutes to as accurately as possible um, show you the history of computing and databases and what's next in 15 minutes. Um, so, and it's meant to be kind of fun, so bear with me. Um, so the first thing is gonna be the history of computing. And the idea here is that as you see the history of computing, what you'll also see is that there was database technology that was attached to each of the different platforms that came out. And that as computing platforms change, the database platforms change with it. So I'm gonna just fast forward quickly through the history of computing. So first of all here, you have the lady up there, she's working on the, the 1890 census, so using punch cards. So I've never actually used a punch card, but when I went to computer science school, there was some people from a different generation who were telling me that they knew what punch cards were. This is what one looks like. And this was first commercialized by Tom Watson Sr., who was the entrepreneur behind IBM in 1914. And then IBM eventually became this you know, famous company that everyone invested their retirement funds in the 1950s into. Um, that continued with his son, Thomas Watson Jr., who's pictured over there, and he brought in the vacuum tubes. So they went from punch cards to vacuum tubes. And here's a sample computer from Texas A&M in the 1950s. It's the IBM 650, which was the first mass-produced computer. After that, the next big thing was the mainframes. And mainframes actually still exist today. I've been to several huge financial companies in New York who still run mainframes, and they still run some of the most critical processing of their whole enterprise on the mainframe. So they have a really, they're really sticky in terms of their usage. This one here is one that was pictured at NASA in, in the US, and this is from around 1960s as well. Okay, so then the next major evolution was the creation of the combination of the C programming language and the Unix type operating system. So we're moving out of you know, build this big mainframe into building, pers you know, not personal computers, but you know, servers based on Linux and uh, C, and not Linux, Unix and C. You know, BSD, I think, was the first one based out of um, University of Berkeley. And then Sun was one of the most famous companies to commercialize these server platforms. Um, this picture here is um, Dennis Ritchie, who was one of the people who created C. And this is around, now we're up to like 1978, 1980. After that, you probably recognize Bill Gates, Bill Gates' friends, Bill Gates' other friends, now our friends, Michael Dell, if you know about our history of our company, which is part of EMC. Um, and then Windows actually became super popular. So whether you love it or you hate it, there's a lot of Windows computers out there, and then people actually run databases on them. So that platform is a, is, is a reality. Um, after that, um, this is Linus from the early days. And he basically took the same idea of, of uh, Unix and then created his own version called Linux. I don't think it's named after Linus Linux, but it's, I forget, it's kind of a weird story. Um, this one is a GPL licensed open source product at, or open source kernel. And then 
three famous kind of uh, versions of it that came, that came out, Red Hat, Susie, Debian. And eventually, I think at this point now, it's pretty much well agreed that Linux is the number one server platform out there. So after that, what's next? So now the platform is evolving even further. So it's not just individual servers and even clusters of servers, which you'll see is an important thing, but now clouds, right? So you've got the whole Amazon stack, the whole Google stack, the whole Microsoft stack, and these things are becoming platforms. You can almost think of, think of them kind of like a next generation mainframe or a next generation huge system that has its own APIs and its own ability to program it. And it's still evolving. So this one is still, we don't know the whole story on where this is gonna go yet. This is the current, current latest stuff. Okay, so now, as far as databases. So the idea is that for each one of these platforms that we just looked at, people basically built databases to target that platform. So starting with uh, IBM IMS, which is pre-relational database, um, this is a hierarchical database that was around 1966 running on the mainframe. So they had that huge computer, they want to run database, they created IMS, this is built by IBM, and it became really popular, and it's actually still in production today, I believe. Um, 1974, at the, this is a picture of the IBM, you know, just down in San Jose, 50 miles south of here is the Almaden Research Lab, and there's Jim Gray, famous computer scientist who worked on this. ZOS is the operating system that runs on the mainframe, and they built basically inside IBM System R, which then eventually became DB2, and um, this is a public reference. I've seen it on their website. Morgan Stanley is still a DB2 on mainframe customer listed on the public IBM website. So these, these things, this platform still exists. These databases still exist. After that, you probably know about Larry Ellison in Oracle, right? His first database written, I thought it was pretty cool that his first database was written in assembly language and ran in 128K of memory. Now he's got, you know, his empire of 10 billion annually and, you know, probably 50% of the commercial revenue for, for database products. Um, we talked about Microsoft. You know, they basically borrowed a database code from Sybase and then eventually turned it into their own and rewrote a lot of it. Um, again, because the platform is popular, there's a lot of people using Microsoft SQL Server. Um, the guy down in the corner actually is kind of an interesting story for me, for us personally, for me personally, because he, he created an optimizer technology which is used in SQL Server, which is also similar to what we use in our Greenplum product based on the Cascades Optimizer Framework, which is a, a modular design for building optimizers. Um, MySQL, I'll go quickly through this one. Um, <laughs> Postgres, you guys already know about Postgres, I don't need to tell you about it. Um, you know, this was the, the cool images I can find about it. Um, Teradata, so Teradata, here's where you start seeing a difference in the platform. So Teradata is not running on a single machine. Teradata is running on a cluster. And in fact, when it came out, there wasn't really high-speed networks. So Teradata had to build the hardware themselves. And I got this from this guy in the corner, Chuck, who I used to work with, um, who was like employee number 20 over there. And basically, they built their own hardware, they had their own networking equipment, they had their own operating system in order to make a platform that could run a multi-computer database, right? And because they were the first ones in the market, they, they created a business that has 2.7 billion of revenue, public reference of British Airways doing data warehousing and SQL, it's a very powerful system. And that's leveraging clusters of computers, right? After that, um, a whole bunch of companies took the core Postgres and created MPP databases. So here's five of them. They've all been created, they all commercialized, and they were all actually purchased by other big companies. In total, they were purchased for over a billion dollars. Um, and all of them basically started with Postgres and then built MPP stacks. They all had their pluses and minuses and you know, the reason, you know, their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, uh, but basically, what people realized was, was that in order, in, if they want to make a distributed database, the best and most efficient way is to take Postgres, which is the core open source BSD licensed database, and use that as the, as the heart of such a system. Okay, now the next thing is Hadoop. So I was actually at Yahoo when Hadoop came around, and some of my colleagues from there are even in the audience here today. And, um, 
I think the, the real story was, was that they, had, they wanted to build a database that ran on a couple thousand nodes. And you know, kind of the alternative was one of these Teradata, which is very, very expensive. Since we're being recorded, I'm not going to say how expensive. But it's a very expensive system. And they basically said, OK, if, if I don't get all the features of a database, but at least I can store some data and run a MapReduce job, at least I can get some of my work done. I think that's kind of the, the origin of how it started. So they basically cut out like you know, MVCC and transactions and you know, pretty much most of the features and said, well, I can store the data and I can run a MapReduce. And it can run it on 2,000 nodes. So anyway, this platform, these 1,000 node cluster platforms became another platform that now obviously people are using and it, and it has its strengths. OK, so what's next? So if you start from the use cases, what is people are going to be doing with data? What's the future of data, right? So here's kind of six inspirational image files. Um, starting from the left, I don't know if you've seen the TV show The Person of Interest, where somebody in the room must have seen it, where they're building what they call the machine. The machine is the thing that consumes all data and calculates everything and then determines, you know, prevents crime. Kind of like Minority Report, but with computers instead of people who are psychic. Um, then you've got the, the stock market and financial, right? People are doing analytics on financial data. The whole financial industry is, is data-driven at this point. The, the next picture of the airplane, that one represents sensors, the, the, internet, or the internet of things, right? People are collecting sensor data from systems all over, the, all over the world and then actually analyzing and creating value based on that data. Agriculture, genetics, taxis, everything, right? So all of these use cases, and they all require tons of data and tons of processing. So we've got to take the problem from a single machine and drive it to scale onto big clusters of, of systems, whether they be dedicated clusters or they be on top of these new cloud-based architectures. So basically, this is what it is we're trying to build. But if you look at the history, every one of these different platforms, they're still building the same stuff. They're still building query optimizers. They're still building ex the ways to execute the query. They're still building transaction processing. The problems seem to stay the same, but now the platform is different. So now we're doing it on clusters. We're doing it on clouds. But you still need a query optimizer. You still need transaction processing. So these core disciplines like Jim Gray's transaction processing or the art of computer programming, it's the same core things, but now applied to bigger platforms, more large-scale clusters, cloud environments, multi-data center. So basically, take, going just back one slide, going to solve all these problems and doing it using core database and core computer science disciplines across and running on big platforms. That's basically where I think the future is going to. And now for the one slide promotional pitch, we have three of these projects that we're working on at Pivotal. All three are 100% open source projects. One of them is Greenplum, which is the scale-out MPP database based on Postgres. The other one is a Hadoop-based um, scale-out database as well. And then the third one, Gemfire, which is for transaction processing in memory. So all of these are open source projects, and we're going to be working closely with the community, and we invite everybody to come and participate in the mailing list and work with us and to collaborate. Thank you. Databases are cool. Enjoy. Oh, that's okay. Thanks, Ivan. Okay, thank you, Ivan.